Welcome to the MAM Journals. The 1970s was a period of great innovation in the bike market. Sadly, by that time, the British bike industry was really, as they say, all over bar the shouting. In fact, that battle had been lost in the 60s. And in, indeed, you could, some would argue slightly before that, in 1959, Honda was the biggest manufacturer of bikes in the world. The British had, had allowed the Japanese to enter the small bike market, thinking that they would preserve the more valuable big bike market whilst allowing others to enjoy the small pickings. I think that, with hindsight, was possibly a bit naive. The Japanese wanted all of the market. And this period of the 70s was hugely exciting because if we knew that the Japanese were going to dominate, what we didn't know was what sort of bikes they'd dominate with. There was a fascinating debate going on. Was it going to be two-stroke two twins, triples? Or was it going to be four-stroke, four-cylinder bikes like Honda's stunning CB754 and indeed Kawasaki's Z1. Today I'm going to be re reviewing one of Suzuki's two-stroke iconic bikes from the period and this particular bike, a stunning 1976 GT750A. What I'm going to be doing is going through the specifications of the bike talk you around it. We'll go out for a GoPro ride when I'll be adding a little bit more colour to the history and what it was like as a, a riding experience and then I'll be coming back here and giving you my final and concluding thoughts. I do hope that you enjoy the video. The GT750 was initially shown in the Japan, the Tokyo show, in October 1970. They launched it for their domestic market in 71 and broadened its sales to the worldwide market in 1972. This bike is actually a 1976 bike and it's designated the GT750A. Production on the bikes finished in 1977 and that bike logically was called the B. The bike is fitted with a water-cooled 738cc inline triple and obviously it's a two-stroke. It produced 70 brake horsepower which is slightly more than the earlier bikes at 6,500 revs and it produces 85 newton metres of torque at 5,500. If you think in terms of pounds foot that's 61. The bike was a sort of development really from the T500 twin. Um, obviously with cooling and one more cylinder, but it was a logical progression of where next. The bike is fitted with these Makuni, these are VM32s sliders, and from memory, and indeed from that little bit of work that I've, I've done researching it, I think they, they were fitted on all the bikes throughout the range. The bike is fitted with a five-speed gearbox and is obviously chain-drived, and those ratios change slightly over time. Indeed, this, this bike, the 76 bike, it was raised from previous um, gearings. At the front, you've got telescopic front forks, you'd expect. We're, I'm not, not sure what the measurements of these are, but I'm just going to call them really skinny. And it's fitted with these 295 mil solid discs, which more about when we uh, we go GoPro riding. Um, interesting feature of it if you can see this calipers fitted at the front and indeed I had a 1977 Z1000 A1 and they were fitted at the front but they were beginning to learn as a result of sort of racing and wind tunnel development that actually the best place to put them was out of the wind to give you more stability at the front but just an interesting design comment. The bike itself is 2,215 millimeters long and it's got a a wheelbase of 1460 millimeters and if you think in inches that's 57 and a half which is in nowadays when we think in terms of dimensions that's what I call middle of the road um, dimensions and style. Um, I'm not sure what the rake of the the front is but it's it's not particularly acute 
you know, I, I'd guess maybe 25 looking at it. So that tells me the bike is a GT, i.e. Grand Tourer, not an out-and-out -out sports bike, which indeed was how it was presented and viewed. The bike weighed, and I've seen various, it, the weights changed on the bikes as it developed, but I think this particular bike um, weighs 507 pounds dry, and according to one of the sources I've looked at, that equated to 552 pounds wet. If you think of kilos, 251 kilos. So for a two-stroke, that's a heavy old bike. At the back, the, the, the bike is fitted with traditional um, shock absorbers, one either side, with no adjustment. You didn't really get adjustment other than this, obviously, preload, the old camel's back, where you just cantilever it round. The rear brake is um, a drum. That's a 195 millimeter drum. No, 190 from memory. Wheels-wise, it's fitted with that's that at the rear is an 18 um, with, a, with a 400, and the front tire is that's a 19-inch tire, 325. Bikes of the time, that's the sort of tires that they had. The tank is uh, 17 litres, or if you think imp imperial gallons, 3.7 gallons, or if you think in American gallons, 4.5. It actually had this one, you can see, has a lockable cap, which was actually a new addition for the 76 model year. And again, going back to the front wheel, you can see that it's still got these um, mudguard braces, which were included on all the models until the very last one in 1977. This bike has been... Uh, beautifully restored and was done uh, well 4722 miles ago the bike's actually done another 30,000 miles on top of that um, but they really he really did a nut and bolt thorough complete strip down and rebuild and getting the the details right on these bikes is is a, a, a labor of love really and little things which you know just to me tell me the extra care Getting the stickers right, the right stickers and in the right place, is really challenging. The, these are right, as indeed is this one. Little things like the, uh, the, the yellow sticker on there. Again, just getting hold of them is a career. And even as far as this revving to the red zone, especially racing the, air, the engine, is prohibited in any case. I suspect some of the early owners didn't worry too much about that but as I say this this bike really is beautifully done uh, the the bike is it's, it's the original engine and it's the original frame the frame itself has been powder coated because everything's been completely off as I say it was a nut and bolt rebuild and a lot of the parts have been re-chromed, I think, probably to a higher standard than the original. You can get these things too shiny, um, in my opinion, uh, but this is, to me, nicely in keeping with the original. It's got new stainless rims and spokes on the wheels, and inside the engine, it's had pistons, rings, crank seals, and various other bits, including the head bolts done. It's got new sprockets on it, and it, in, indeed a new front mudguard. And one of the things that was famous for rotting out on these bikes was the seat base, and they've managed to find one. And that is just perfect. So nicely done. If I'm you know, if I'm being hypercritical, I, I I think this this bike is at the level it could you know be entered into concourse competitions and various things. And the real experts, I don't consider myself one, could go through everything on it and point out exactly which is original and which isn't. Um, but again, 
to me it's a beautifully restored bike so clean when i when i finished riding it i i didn't so much clean it as dust it i mean it is as you can see sort of down underneath the engine here it really is immaculate beautifully done right i'm going to be hypercritical and just a couple of things which i found on it these for the seals are good the fork seals it had new fork seals during the ring but you can see the slight pitting on the forks there so that over time would probably be for the completely OCD amongst us something that that could be done you can get these actually sort of stripped down and re um, re-chromed and there's a little bit of corrosion at the base of the internal of the headlamp in the reflector there and if again if you're a purist you'd say well those these exhausts are not the original they're as rare as hen's teeth this is the Delkovic copies that they've made successfully for many years and it's entirely in keeping with the bike it you can actually still get those they are alone are just under 1400 pounds just for the exhaust the total spend on this bike and you know when you're dealing with a nice restoration because you get one of these you get a huge file showing everything that's been done to the bike and all the um, various MOTs and details of what's been fitted and where it was bought and how so that was you know a really nice thing to see if you're buying a bike of what I would des describe as collectible rather than just a rider so really nicely done and a great credit I was amazed to be given the opportunity to, to ride it In total, over £10,000 has been spent on this restoration. It's a stunning example to look at. So what was it like to ride? Getting on the bike, I was immediately reminded just how mechanical bikes were in the 70s. There's no clutch or brake reservoirs here, and if you want a gear, you actually have to select it keen to let the bike warm up carefully and put some fuel and two-stroke through it, I made my way gently on A roads, only asking for steady revs until I was comfortable that both the water temperature indicated by the top gauge and the engine temperature, a guesstimate based on time and feel, were ready to be asked for more. Warm the bike comfortably pulls 17 miles per hour at just over 4,000 revs in fifth. Anyone who's owned a 47 year old bike will know that you can put them away running perfectly and next time you get them out there'll be something not quite right. That's the joys of classic ownership. This bike was last run about a year ago and I quickly noticed that the low rev pickup was a little hesitant but that once up the revs, it pulled cleanly and willingly. A pretty good indication that the pilot jets need to clean, which is not a big job. It actually ran better with a few miles on it, and once moving, the bike went surprisingly well. The engine is without doubt the star of the show, delivering its 70 brake horsepower in a progressive, smooth and linear way this is not the furious power band some two strokes can be, but rather a soft tune Grand Tourer, as it indeed it was later marketed as, despite the occasional photos of Barry Sheen riding one would like to suggest. Suzuki GT750s were production raced in its early days, but frankly they were nothing like this bike and as time progressed, Suzuki were increasingly clear about that. The committed speed seekers of the day quickly gravitated to the Kawasaki H2750 triple or the Z1 four-stroke, the king of the road. None of these observations should be taken as criticisms. The more I rode the bike, the more I liked its calm, capable feel and performance. It was a bike I felt you could actually ride quite a long way on, although you would be stopping regularly for fuel. Suzuki claimed 42 miles a gallon-ish, 
uh, but with a pilot jet not entirely supportive, I certainly achieved nothing like that. Petrol cools sprang to mind. The gearbox was easy to select, and neutral best selected from second, not first, easy to find. I found the digital gear light helpful. I do wish my ZRX 1200 had one, and it might actually stop me endlessly seeking another gear. The instrumentation was clear and easy to read. The bike showed 4,000 odd miles, but the detailed records show that the bike covered 30,000 miles before the clocks were reset and refurbished. A journey back in time. I enjoyed them. I actually attended two vintage bike meetings during my time on the bike and it certainly attracted attention. An experienced rider on his new Goldwing approached me and I enjoyed his recollections. Like many of us, he could remember riding many of the bikes of the 70s and 80s and had normally worked out exactly how fast they were capable of going within a week of owning them. I think we all did that. Interestingly, he said he didn't do that on his brand new GT750 as it never really felt like that sort of a bike. I know what he meant. I have no doubt the engine would pull the claimed 120 mile per hour it, it is allegedly capable of, but nothing about the chassis, suspension, brakes, or in this case, 12 year old tires, suggested to me that this would be a good idea. It tracks every groove in the road, and frankly, handles like a shopping trolley. We should also talk about the brakes. I should start by saying they performed exactly in line with their design specification. It was one of the first bikes to be fitted with dual front solid discs. Calling them wooden runs the risk of actually being sued by wood for defamation of character. Hopeless would be more accurate and non-existent in the wet. Probably the few times in your life you'll be grateful for a drum rear, which does have some effect. Drilled aftermarket discs would help, but I can understand why anyone would keep it original. If the engine goes well, stopping is definitely at the other end of the spectrum. Contrary to urban myth, engine braking is available on two strokes, although careful gear selection is advisable. Shoving the engine into the power band whilst pulling on the front brake lever as hard as you can would result in an interesting debate. My money is on the engine. Being a two-stroke, it does like to be cleared out occasionally, and once confident with how well the engine was running, I was happy to oblige. The blue haze is probably still clearing now, and a friend riding behind on his LC350 said the bike sounded and smelt fantastic. There is something magical about a two-stroke on song. Suzuki made about 71,000 of these bikes between 1971 and 77 and I am certainly no expert in valuations but the market is definitely quieter now than it has been in the past. Really nicely done ones like this are holding much better than the bikes that have seen more rugged use or less complete restorations. I can see that in other 70s bikes like the Z1, Z900s, collectibles are sought after, riders now less so. I suspect demographics is now playing its part. Riding the bike through Oxfordshire countryside in glorious sunshine was both a joy and a privilege. I was transported back in time to a slightly later two-stroke era of my youth. My experience was on later competitive off-roaders and an RD400. I first actually saw a bike exactly like this one in 1976 as I was making my way back from school in the hot summer that we enjoyed that year. It's actually taken me 47 years to ride one. 
it was well worth the wait. So what were my, my concluding thoughts? Well, I've been lucky enough to both own and indeed ride quite a few Japanese vintage bikes. And I think this is probably one of the nicest examples I've been lucky enough to ride. As I said in my introduction, this bike is iconic, a word sometimes used, used too freely, um, but to my mind, it justifies the title. Approaching the pinnacle of their two-stroke road bike development of the time, this bike actually was already, by the time this was made, in the process of being superseded. Suzuki launched their inline 750 four four-stroke in the same year that this bike was produced. And indeed, two years later, they launched the probably in its own way equally iconic GS1000, a bike that they took to enormous success in the really important AMA Superbike Championship of that period with a tuner called Pops Yoshimura and a rider called Wes Cooley. They won the title in 1979 and 1980. So, if it, at a glance it would appear the two stroke era was over. It, in fact, had a bit of a re resurrection in later generations when bikes like the 500cc two stroke race replicas were launched by Yamaha and Suzuki. And of course, for two stroke fans, there is still the famous Yamaha LC to come. A large part for the redrawal from the, of of these types of bikes from the market was to do with emission regulations in America. And indeed, later two strokes were aimed more focusedly at the European market. The sports tourer concept, of course, continues even today. Um, Grand Tourers, GTs, are still available from Suzuki. Indeed, one of my favorite bikes is their current offering the GT1000. So I can't close this video without thanking Steve Polden from King's Two Wheel Centre for allowing me the opportunity to ride this bike. I've, it's been in his showroom for many years and I've known Steve over 40 and I felt slightly uneasy about suggesting that I might want to take that for a ride. So indeed I never did. Then one day when he said to me, would you like the GT to take the GT out for a few days? Um, he's lucky, frankly, to have an arm left. It was a great opportunity to tick off something that's been on my bucket list since I was a teenager. So thank you. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you found it interesting. And if you've enjoyed watching it as much as I've enjoyed riding and making it, then you definitely will have done. If you did, you might be kind enough to press like or even consider subscribing to the channel but as i always say what's most important is ride safe stay well <laughs>